hello, Kalamazoo. It is your girl, Stephanie Moore. Happy Juneteenth. Yes, we are some free-ish today, y'all. So I am so happy. I'm honored to bring uh, right here live to you to social media, a very good friend of mine, uh, Cliff Albright. He's one of the co-founders of Black Voters Matter. Uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about the organization, uh, the work that Cliff does, and then even this movement that we are in right now. So I want to give you all just another couple of seconds to join us, but we're going to jump right on into this. Uh, you all, Kalamazoo, uh, up here in the Midwest, this is a big, big treat for us to have this powerhouse, this amazing gentleman uh, that's going to come and talk to us about the Black Voters Matter Fund. So without further ado, the co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund, Cliff Albright. Cliff, uh, introduce yourself to Michigan. Hey, hey, Stephanie. Happy Juneteenth to you and to everybody else out there. Happy Liberation Day. Um, I'm Cliff Albright, co-founder of Black Voters Matter, executive director. And, um, you know, we are a power building organization. Uh, we believe in building power in black communities. We believe that elections are one way of doing that, but by no means the only way of doing that. In fact, the past three weeks have really demonstrated that, right? That you, you can build power in the streets. Uh, one of the things we always say is we didn't we didn't vote for the Voting Rights Act, right? We had to march and protest for the Voting Rights Act, and so uh, so we believe in supporting local groups that go about this business 365 days out of the year. We always say Black Voters Matter 365. It's core. One of our core beliefs is that we believe in investing in community-based groups, investing in local groups, um, doing the hard work and hitting the streets at the local level. It's not just about you know, the, the top of the ticket and presidential races and gubernatorial races, but it's about, you know, city council, county commission, um, state legislature, um, you know, it's about all, all those things, um, sheriffs, DAs, right? Um, and that's really one of the, the beautiful things about the entire, you know, Black Lives Matter and moving for Black Lives is, you know, three, four years ago, DA's races and sheriff's races, those weren't things we were really focusing on. But, you know, over the past few years, we've seen like growing attention pay to those things. And so we like to seed into that. We like to support groups. We like to support sometimes financial support, sometimes tools and technology, sometimes helping with some texting programs. You know, you, Stephanie, you've been using some, some of the technology, doing online surveys by social media and by text, um, you know, trying to take the best of what we've always done which is, you know, being in the streets and having those door conversations and and and, and using our religious organizations and, and our neighborhood associations and doing that door-to-door -door work and combining it with some of this this uh, new technology and new tools that are that are out there. And then sometimes what we do is we just we strategize with folks. Like we we can come in and say, we look, you know, y'all got this going on in Kalamazoo. Look what's going on over here in other parts of Michigan. Or look what we got going on and what some of our partners are doing in some other states. And just kind of taking the best practices and lessons learned and seeing, you know, how we can replicate some stuff. Because first and foremost, we want folks to know that they are not alone. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we travel around the places. We, we go to places in our big old black bus that we call the Blackest Bus in America. Um, uh, we go to folks and connect. And if we don't do anything else, if we don't let folks know that they are not alone, right? That the things that they're dreaming and scheming, that they're not crazy for thinking those things, that you know, that, that a new society is possible, that we have power. We have the power to achieve these things. If we don't do anything else but you know, have that mindset shift that gets lets folks know that they are loved and they have power, um, then you know, if we can do that, then we've done our job. Absolutely. That is totally amazing. I wanted to just touch on really quick, uh, Cliff, you talked about the technology and using it. Uh, not too long ago, just a, a week or so ago, I was uh, using some technology, getting people to uh, communicate with local government. Over 1,000 emails to send to local officials asking them to declare racism as a public health crisis. Right. And to uh, call for them to pass a resolution to end police brutality. So when we give people that access and opportunity, they put it to work. You That's talked right. about the bus and some of your work. Where are you based at and kind of where uh, location wise are you doing a lot of this work? Yeah, so we're based.
based in we're based in Atlanta, um, and um, we do this work in ten states, ten ten core states, right? Because we got ten states where we do like our full programs. We got a state coordinator that that lives in that state that partners with groups, sometimes up to twenty five or thirty different groups across the state. Uh, you know, helps to coordinate them and do monthly conversations. So there's 10 states where we do our comprehensive program. And then there's another four or five states where we just have kind of um, some targeted partnerships, you know, where there's particular cities in the state, you know, someplace like Texas, where, you know, we're not really trying to take on the whole state of Texas right now, but we got some key partnerships in Houston and developing a couple in, in Dallas, you know, right now, as a matter of fact, in Kentucky. Um, you know, Kentucky is another one of those states where we don't have a comprehensive program, but we got some partners in Louisville, you know, Black Lives Matter in Louisville and, and some other organizations. And in fact, we're doing some stuff there right now for their for their primary election. And so there's a few states like that where we have some real targeted, but we got 10 core states. Most of them are in the South, eight are in the South, and that's everything from Louisiana going west to east from Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, both Carolinas, North and South. Um, and, uh, and then we got two states in the north, including the great state of Michigan and uh, also Pennsylvania. Now, you know you couldn't leave us out. Michigan is rocking and rolling, and we are so happy to be a partner with the Black Voters Matter. We were honored to have the biggest, blackest bus right here in Michigan, particularly right here in Kalamazoo. An unforgettable moment. People are still talking about that. Everywhere I go, I'm still seeing people with Black Voters Matter t-shirts. So let's talk about what's happening in the world today. Well, first of all, I want to back up, Cliff, and ask you, why Black voters? Black voters matter is this mantra. We're really trying to show or um, educate people in the power of the vote. Why Black voters and why do we matter? Yeah, well, well, first, you know, I want to say that part of the reason we call the organization Black Voters Matter and not Black Votes Matter is because there's a lot of folks out there that care about Black votes but they don't really care about black voters, right? And so we wanted to make it clear that we care about our people. Um, and so, you know, it's about the voters. It's not about just rounding us up and seeing us as numbers and seeing us on a tally sheet, but it's about recognizing that it's about us. It's about our issues. That's why those shirts that you were just talking about on the back of them, it says, it's about us. Because we're not about just being about candidates or being about one election cycle right we're about being about our issues and that means 365 days out of the year and every year there's no such thing as an off year like a lot of people last year after we came out the midterms in 2018 a lot of people were like oh you know oh this you know 2019 y'all could get the rest a little i'm like no because in 2019 we had we had a whole bunch of states that had local races mayor's races county races right state legislative races doggone it a whole louisiana legislature was was on the ballot last year so we were like no there is no off year for us when you when you really care about these issues these issues don't go away just because it's an off year gentrification doesn't know that it's an off year right police violence doesn't know that it's an off year there is no such thing as an off year and so um when we say you know when we focus on black voters it's because fundamentally what we know for a couple things one we know that we're catching the most hell right we we know that um, you know we're the, the coronavirus is a perfect example, right? It's tearing apart the whole country, but it's tearing apart our communities disproportionately. Even when you look at the nursing home issue, right? All this talk about how much impact it's having on the nursing homes, even that's not even because what the research has shown that it's nursing homes that have a predominantly black population that are having the largest rate of increase, the largest rate of spread of the coronavirus. So you take whatever the issue is, healthcare. Um, um, housing, you know, jobs during this crisis. And, you know, what we always say, like when, when, when white America uh, gets a cold, we catch the flu, right? And now literally we're in that situation of, of catching, a, catching a virus. And so what we know is that when you deal with our issues, you know, it's kind of like Sealy and Color Purple, right? Till you do right by us, ain't nothing you're going to touch going to be right, right? And, and today of all days is a perfect Reminder of that, right? We are still fighting as much as this is a celebration and we need to celebrate, right? When I finish with you, I'm gonna go find me a, a cookout somewhere. But even though today's a day of celebration, it's also a day where we remember that, you know, we had justice delayed for two years. We had emancipation delayed for two, two and a half years, right? And not just those two and a half years, we're still fighting for the same things that the folks in Texas and Galveston thought we're going to be right around the corner when they got that news on Juneteenth, right? Uh, we're still fighting for quality housing. We're still fighting for 
um, uh, for our wages to be at the at an equal rate, right? We're we're still riding, we're still fighting to be equally counted because the Constitution says we're three fifths, and we know that every every time we do a census, we get undercounted, and so we're still fighting for some of the very same things that folks were 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 fighting for and celebrating on Juneteenth in 1865. And so um, so when we say black voters, it's because we know that when we come up, when, when y'all do right by us, then the entire country benefits. There's never been any one of our movements where this entire country hasn't, hasn't benefited. There's, there's no civil right that we got that other folks haven't, uh, haven't also benefited from, right? It's, there's no, if the Black Panthers in the 60s were calling for universal health care. And look where we at today, right? And so the, the the demands that we make and the focus that we have on black voters are one because we're we're the most dispossessed, right? Um, although you can make an argument, I don't ever want to forget our, our indigenous brothers and sisters, right? But one because we know that we're in greatest need, but two because what we know is that when we say that we matter and when we do right by us and deal with our issues, everybody in this country benefits. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And so we have the opportunity to educate, to empower, to really get people involved in civic engagement, not only make sure that every registered voter is registered, but that they cast their vote and their vote be counted. So this is a critical year for us um, as well as every other year, Cliff, because in Michigan, particularly, we're going to be doing a lot of uh, um online registration, as well as mailing in our ballots. Even in Kalamazoo, although we are uh, able to have to go into the polls and vote, uh, there's a huge push for people to do uh, absentee ballot. There's no excuse. You you can do it. Um, talk a little bit about your experience with that. I know, you know, we know about Georgia elections and everything. And what advice can you give to people about participating? Yeah, there's a couple of key pieces, and you're right. We just had a, a nightmare of an election last week. You can't even really call it an election. Um, you know, people waiting online for five hours, six hours, and it was really a combination of a bunch of different issues. Some of them related to vote by mail. I'll talk about that in a second. Some of them related to the machines themselves because the, the Secretary of State here basically gave a contract to some of his cronies to use some machines that are um, less safe, that are known to be hackable, that were known to have breakdowns, and that's all what, what happened last week here in Georgia. And that was a large part of why there were such long lines and such long waits. But the other part of that is like what you were saying, it was the vote by mail. A lot of the people that were in those lines last week, Tuesday, were in line because they tried to vote by mail, but they never got their ballot. Or maybe they maybe they got their ballot, but um, you know they tried to send it back, or they couldn't send it back because the Secretary of State didn't include prepaid postage, and postage was was an issue for some people, or any number of issues. My son, my my second son, um, he he applied for his uh, vote by mail ballot, never got it, and so on the last day of early vote, he decided that he needs to just go early vote because we didn't know if it was going to come at all, and uh, he waited in line for for six hours. So so the important lesson is. And it's not just Georgia, you know, Wisconsin showed us this a couple of months ago. Having a, a statewide vote by mail is a beginning, right? But it's not, there's so many pitfalls, so many spaces where voter suppression can play a role from, you know, not including postage to um, having a deadline that says that the ballot has to be received by election day and not just postmarked by election day, right? You've got these, um, you've got states like in Alabama right now where they have these photo ID uh, requirements. So you gotta make copies of your ID and include it with the ballot. You've got signature match policies, which say that, you know, if they get a ballot and, and, the, and the signature doesn't match what they have on record, which may be a signature from 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but if it doesn't match, then they may not count that. That that's a where a uh, place where voter suppression can come, and so there's so many pitfalls to the vote by mail. That doesn't mean that we don't push it, right? We've got to because right now it's the safest way for our folks to be able to vote. But we just have to be diligent and be aware that there's so many spaces where they can still use a, a vote by mail process to suppress the vote, and that's exactly what some of these states are trying to do. You still have states that, um, unlike Michigan and unlike Georgia, they're not even trying to accept coronavirus is being a, a, a reason for folks to vote by mail. So we know what their goals are. They've already told us, Trump said it. He said, if we do these kinds of things, if we expand the vote, if we do vote by mail, Republicans will never win an election. Mitch McConnell said it. 
right here in Georgia, our Republican Speaker of the House said it. They're they're not even trying to hide the fact that they really view vote by mail as a as a threat because if, if you use it effectively, if you do what some other states like Oregon and Washington who have been doing it for years, if you really use it that way, this could transform um, voter access and transform some of these election results. Absolutely. I completely agree with you on that. Uh, one of the things that we do have in Michigan as well is that you can track your absentee ballot application to make sure that it was received by the clerks. But we've also experienced, Cliff, uh, even in the last election where they did the vote by mail, that number one, people did uh, ask for their uh, application. They did their application, submitted it to the clerk's office, but never received their ballot. Um, we did Mothers of Hope. We tried our best to try to follow up and follow through on there. Um, I, I know that we probably missed some folks, but it's critical to make sure that people actually have access to the process by getting their, their ballot um, and being able to trust that. One of the things I wanted to share with you, too, is that um, because due to the corona pandemic, uh, particularly our local county government, like many others, have been closed to the public for so long. And one of the things that's happened is, is now that we are starting to slowly reopen, um, our clerk's office in particular uh, is, is opening by appointment. But for so long, they have not responded, follow up. Um, they haven't taken care of the public in a timely manner. So there is this fear now from people that are saying, I don't know if I want to trust mailing in my ballot. Are they going to get it, receive it, process it? And how do I know that they will so that my vote will actually be counted? Right. No, that's a, that's an excellent point. And one of the things we always say is when folks share those kinds of concerns, whether it's about vote by mail or about the census or about some of the other civic engagement tactics that we often try, when folks share those concerns, the first thing we have to do is just kind of affirm it. Like we have to hear folks when they say that, because the truth is they're not crazy, right? They're not making it up. It's not an unfounded fear, right? And so we have to affirm folks that we hear them, we hear those concerns, but we also have to empower folks to let them know, you know, what it is that we're doing to fight against some of those issues. Like what are, what are the strategies that we have? What are the tutorials that we have created? What's the, the processes that we use? Like you said, if y'all have a website where you can track ballots, you know, here in Georgia, we've had um, partners who have been really good at um, getting those lists and filtering those lists and seeing, okay, these 10,000 people applied, but they never got it back. Let's make sure we reach out to them with a, with a phone call or with the text message under normal conditions with the door knock, right? And so there are ways that we can be really effective at really looking at like where where are the, all the all the cracks in the process? Because we know there's cracks. Where are there cracks in the process? What are the things that we can do to, to hold those folks accountable who are supposed to be administering these elections? What are those things that we need to do to get some of our community members some accurate info, right? So just trying to plug in as many of those gaps as possible. But when folks have those concerns, it's legit. You yeah. know, we just have to do our our job, which is to know what those 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 gaps are and then try to plug them up as best we can. And to Absolutely. make the demand that we have the resources, especially from these national folks, you got everybody in the mama who care about Michigan, right? Everybody in the mama knows Michigan's an important state. So if they believe in Michigan, don't just show up in Michigan in November asking black folks to save the country. Help us with this upcoming election that you got. Help us build up these 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 muscles and these practices, right? So that we can get this process down, and then we can talk about November, right? Help us with these issues, like you're talking about the excessive force um, ordinances. Mm -hmm. Help us with what we're demanding right now, and then we can talk to you about November. But don't just be absent and quiet right now when we when we need support, and then show up in, in Michigan in October talk about we need you. So, you know, we, you talked a little bit about voting and be counted in the census, which we want to make sure, especially uh, black and brown people are doing that and the highest record uh, number. We also talked a little bit, you touched on even the Black Lives Matter. We, we're facing police brutality uh, over and over again. Uh, now there's a movement. People are lifting their voices, raising their fist. Their fist. There are some opportunities to pass some agendas, especially a black civil rights uh, equity agenda. Talk about some opportunities in the midst of what we're going through now. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're already seeing the opportunities. And in fact, we're seeing some of the results, right? Um, you know, we, we've seen jurisdictions, whether it's San Francisco, Minneapolis, you know, folks that are what? They're, they're, they're pulling police forces out of school systems. 
they're, they're they're passing pledges and they are pledges at this point but still they're passing pledges to um to defund the police and to 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 get rid of um um budget items they're you know we've seen in some cities where they've got in new york got rid of an entire force right an entire uh, uh a plains closed police force right and so we're seeing different things that are already being passed in, in city after city. And so um, there's a huge opportunity here for us to reimagine what policing looks like, right? To reimagine what, what budgets that actually prioritize human services, investing in our young folks and investing in housing and jobs rather than investing in, you know, just law enforcement, you know, or even investing in mental health services. Because the truth is, you know, something like wellness checks, because what happened to Rashad Brooks here in Atlanta never should have happened because it never been a should have, never should have been a phone call to the police right you could it should have been a phone call for a wellness check instead of the question being are you a threat and what are you up to and are you a criminal the first question should have just been are you all right and if that was where that conversation started and if that was the type of folks who have been called instead of the police brother Rashad would still be alive today right and so there's an opportunity for us to reimagine what policing looks like, to reimagine what our funding structures can look like, to, to reimagine how hiring in police departments are done, to whatever extent those departments still even exist, right? You know, and Juneteenth is such a perfect moment for, for these policy discussions, because you got a lot of folks talking about what's not possible and what's unimaginable, right? That, that a certain type of society just isn't even imaginable. But we're celebrating this day a liberation that came, a change in a situation that many people thought was unimaginable, right? But some folks dare to imagine that Africans in this country could be free, right? Or at least technically free. And so this is a moment where we need to really listen to the demands that are coming from the street and to recognize that those demands um, can have policy implications and we can merge these two worlds of protest and electoral power building, right? Not not replace one for another, not shift one from another, but when we can merge those two worlds, um, the way that they've always been merged when we've been successful, then we can really change the way some of our cities and communities and counties look in this country. So how can um, people get involved with Black Voters Matter? Uh, to volunteer, to even donate, uh, to mm -hmm. even look at what some of the policy issues are that you're championing? Yeah, so you know, there's a couple of ways you can get directly connected to us um, by sending us a text message. You can text "We Matter" to seven nine seven nine seven nine. That's "We Matter" one word to seven nine seven nine seven nine. That'll get you on our texting list. There's a, a link that'll come with that. You fill out that link so that we know, you know, where where you are, what city you're in, what your email address is, and all that. So, so say say, that. say, say the text message again. It's "We Matter" one word. We matter and you send that to seven nine seven nine seven nine all right and that'll get you connected to us the other way that you can do it is that you can connect with organizations like like mothers of hope and, and, and stephanie and because that's what we do we partner with local groups that do this work that you know like like y'all have been doing that, that gives out masks and gives out supplies and does testing and and was doing census right and so um, um you can get connected with organizations like mothers of hope or whatever wherever you are whatever the the organizations are in your community um and if, if we're not already connected to those organizations then that's part of the reason you can get connected to us because we're always looking for new organizations to jo join this movement and so you can text us and send us a message let us know what your organization is For our, our organization, we're not even trying to replicate ourselves in all of the states that we're in. We want folks to get with Mothers of Hope. We want folks to get with Detroit Action. We want folks to get with Mother and Justice. We want folks to get with Southern Rural Women's Black Women's Initiative. Um, you know, we want folks to get with those groups that are right there doing this work 365 days out of the year. But no matter where you are, there's something for you to do. You can text from a distance, you can phone bake. From a distance, there's so many. You can do postcarding. We got folks all over this country that are doing postcarding and sending postcards to to key um, cities and counties where there are key races or we need to mobilize black voters. So there's a there's a role for everybody. There's a role for folks that want to be in the streets protesting. There's a role for folks that want to send text messages. There's a role for some young folks that want to do some TikTok videos and get folks excited, right? Uh, so there's a role, you know, for our creative types. 
you know, there's a role for everybody, especially our creative types, because, you know, we believe in, in the power of Black joy and Black love and Black culture. And in everything we do, we try to have a little element. We did a, a little town hall last night where we had a DJ playing. We always try to have some music or something because we know that that's, that's part of how we always get through is through having some Black love and Black joy and some Black culture. So if you're a creative type, there's a role for you. So no matter what it is, there's a skill set you have where you can contribute to our liberation. Absolutely. That is so awesome and powerful. And I, I have the honor to working with Mothers of Hope partnership with you all. So let's transition because one of the reasons why it was uh, timely to talk to you today, not just because of Juneteenth, which is amazing uh, to have you here then, but we have an event that we're sponsoring uh, tomorrow. It's a Black Lives Matter March for Justice and Voter Registration Drive. And so we're going to be uh, working with uh, Western Michigan University college students and everybody in the community to have the biggest blackest most powerful march tomorrow about us and it's really about us and so um i want to facebook you all are tuning in i see several of you are watching while we're live go ahead and put some comments in the comment section if you got a question for cliff um or you know just want to show some black love and some culture with us go ahead and do that and we'll put your comment up on the screen um but cliff we're, we're going tomorrow and the difference between the march or the marches that we've seen here in our community is the focus is on registering voters. The focus is on making sure that they get on the poll. We will have the technology and electronics there so that they can do it online, the regular application. If they haven't done their census yet, we'll be able to do that for them because we need to get everybody engaged so everyone is participating August 4th and November 3rd. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Like we need, we need all hands on deck. We need everybody involved. Um, but we don't just want them to be involved on our terms, right? Because we know that folks that have been in the streets, you know, that, that there are issues and not even just the folks that have been in the streets protesting, like just like just even before the past three weeks, just a key part of the way that we do what we do. And we know it's important to you is that, you know, we try to really connect that registration process, right? And talking to people about the elections, but it's got to be connected to the issues that, they're, that they care about, like the, the issues that affect them on a daily basis. For some folks, that's police violence. For some folks, you know, some, some folks, it's their utility bills. We've been in communities that have $800 utility bills, power bills, right? Uh, for, for some folks, it's the housing issues. For some folks, it's as simple as, I want a stop sign at the end of my street because we got too many of our young babies dying on these, on these dangerous roads, right? And so whatever those issues are, making those connections so that folks see um, that it's somehow connected to this electoral process. Because there are people that are making decisions over our lives on a daily basis. And a lot of times we haven't had anything to do with, with, with putting them in, right? But we don't want to just, we don't always want to be in a position of having to just, um, you know, respond and, and vote for whoever's out there. We want folks to be able to turn the entire process upside down so that we're even defining the agenda. You know, we, we always say it's like a, like a, it's like a job hiring process but most of the time we got somebody coming to us that, that they want us to hire them, but they're telling us what their job description is going to be. We have to be the ones to write the job description. We have to set the agenda. And now I can judge whether or not you're the best, the best person for it. And so we want to flip the entire process up, upside down. So when we have those conversations as we're doing these registration drives and, and marches, then, you know, it opens up the discussion for a whole different kind of discussion because some folks, some folks will always immediately respond to the registration form, but then you know how it is. We got some folks that are like, I don't want to see that form. You know what that? I ain't got nothing to do with me. What's what's we? We've been voting. We've been voting for six since sixty five, and it ain't, it ain't done nothing, right? And so again, when they say that, we can't shame them. We can't act like they're crazy because again, part of what they're saying has merit, and so we got to hear that. So we every time we do a registration drive, and I know you've seen it. We get some of that, right? We get the folks that are ready to fill it out, and then we get the folks that are having some pushback. So the real challenge is like, what's that discussion that takes place, you know, as we're doing this? You know, are they are they feeling like they're just the um just another tally to be, you know, added into the registration column? Or are they feeling like, 
you know, that they're really being centered, that their issues are being centered and not just their signature. I know you know all this, but there's a lot of folks um, who, when we think about voter registration, we think about just the traditional, you know, fill us out, fill us out, fill us out. But I noticed you all come at it from a different perspective that really centers our folks and centers centers our issues. And that's that's the approach that we think is most successful, especially when it comes from trusted, credible messengers like you. Absolutely. And, you know, we get we run into that all the time with that apathy. But one of the things that we try to do is really, like you said, educate people on the impact of their vote. Most people don't even contact their local uh, legislators, let alone their state and their federal. And so they miss out on a lot of opportunities where we have uh, situations now through the pandemic and people have applied for unemployment assistance uh, and they're looking to try to uh, get those dollars for the CARES Act for the small businesses, minority black owned women owned businesses and that the money has not trickled down. And so what I'm telling folks is your first line of defense is your state representative. When you don't can't access those state dollars, call your state representative. When you're trying to get those federal funds and dollars, call them. When you got situations with the IRS and, and DHS and Child Protective Services and, and your, your, uh, your your, everything that we deal with, um, social security benefits, all that stuff, that contact your, your, your state representative. That's what their offices are there for. That's what we're putting them in position to be that barrier for us. And even on the local level, we have people that deal with homelessness and utility shutoffs and this and that. And there's dollars, there's programs, there's, there's opportunities, and they're not aware of that. So we make that connection and then tell them, Cliff, this is why you have to vote. So you have somebody that represents you that not only connects the resources, but champion those resources coming from the state down to the local so that people can be aware and access them as well. I no, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. That's why even the example that you gave a little while ago, talking about how y'all use the technology to get people to send the, the email around the, around the ordinance that you're trying to get passed is a perfect example of what we're talking All those things are a perfect example of what we're talking about. These tools and tactics that we have to get people to vote, right? They don't need to disappear just because the election's over. We can use these same tools and strategies to do what you to 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 put pressure on council folks to pass the ordinance, to put pressure on them to deal with utilities, right? To to send out useful information about these programs that you're talking about, right? If we if we got these tools, and it's one of the things that frustrates people about these candidate processes, where like they'll hear from the candidate, sometimes an elected official even, they'll hear about them come election time, but then you know. Uh, all of a sudden, I don't hear from you after the election. Like, if you knew how to reach my house and send me some glossy thing in the mail to tell me to vote for you, why you couldn't send something in the mail to talk, tell me about this grant program or about this utilities program, right? Uh, we had this happen to us right here in Atlanta. People got upset at our, at our mayor here because during the, the recent uh, uprisings, they were sending out, the city sent out um, text messages to everybody, like emergency broadcast, everybody in Metro Atlanta. I don't even live technically within the city limits, and I got it. Everybody got a message talk at, at a quarter nine talking about the curfews coming up. Make sure you get inside. And people got upset, not not even just so much because they got that message, but because well, we, we didn't get a message um, about coronavirus. We didn't get a message about protecting our vote, right? Y'all, the city has the same... That same system could be used for any number of things, but what you chose to use it for was to tell us to get our black butts inside the house, right? And so if we have these tools and these, these, these resources, let's use them to talk to our folks about a range of issues, all those issues that, that you just talked about. And in that way, when they've been getting messages from us once a month, you know, or, or every couple of months, letting us know like what's available, or how about just letting us, letting us know that somebody's thinking about them, hey, uh, and, you know, I know the coronavirus still ain't over. How you doing? Right? Do you, do you need to know about tests? Whatever. Just checking in on folks when they've been getting those messages all throughout the year. Then when you come back and you say, "Hey, elections coming up. Guess what? They already on your side because you've been having that dialogue for the entire year." That's what it means to be a credible messenger and an authentic voice and a trusted voice. And so, and that's those are the kinds of partners that we're looking for. And that's exactly the kind of work y'all are doing right there in Kalamazoo. Well, Cliff, before we have to wrap up, because I know you're a busy man and you, you're doing great things in the community, give us some hope. It's been really hard 
on us, not just in Michigan, but across the country. The coronavirus pandemic, we've been sheltering in place. Some of us have been off work, lost wages. We've been taking care of our, our sick family members when we didn't really even know what to do to try to take care of them. Uh, we have so many people, especially Black folks, who are essential workers on the front line every day, risking their lives to serve the community for less pay than most folks and still risking their family lives coming back to their homes, maybe uh, uh, in infecting them as well. So let's, you know, give get a community some hope and some direction of how we, uh, through our resilience, continue to rise up and move forward to, to even make our quality of life even better. Yeah, I, I, I think you said the words right there when you talk about our resilience and, and, and rising up, right? At the end of the day, you know, two, 200 and, um, um, 50, I mean, 155 years after the original Juneteenth, right? Um, you know, still I rise, right? We still here, we still rising. I mean, to just to see, you know, the hope is also in like just what we've seen over the past two and a half weeks. This country's never even really seen something like what we've seen over the past two and a half weeks. The civil rights movement, obviously, we had sustained protests for a good 10, 15 year period, right? But like like for in one city to be having like sustained protests for like two weeks straight, two weeks, two through almost three weeks straight of folks in the streets demanding that Black Lives Matter, like and in over 600 cities for that to take place. You know, so there's hope there that we are, we are, we our vision is coming to pass, right? That we are making changes uh, and, and it's, it's a cultural change, but it's also a policy a policy change. And so some of the hope lies right in that. Some of the hope lies in, you know, what we saw here in Georgia, you know, as, as, as much suppression as we saw on election day last week, folks stood in line for five hours and six hours and had record numbers for turnout, record numbers for turnout. And this is an election, mind you, where the presidential primary was basically settled. There's no real race, right? And so people were coming out just to make a statement around being involved and voting up and down, up and down the ballot. That's a source of hope. But you know, again, just the fact that we are here and on this day we are celebrating together. We are we are loving one another. We are um, celebrating black love and, and, and black joy and black cultures on display all around the all around the culture. You know, that's that's just a testimony to the resilience. What we know and we say it all the time is the last thing I'll say. When we believe, we work together. And when we work together, we win. And that's what we try to do, right? We are trying to get folks to believe in the power that we have. And then in having that power to work together. And when we do those things, um, and we got a little love sprinkled inside all of that, that's when we win. And so, um, and that's what I'm seeing right now. So that's, that's the hope. My hope comes from literally what we're seeing taking place right now. And the church say amen. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for taking some time to, to talk to us, inspire us, empower uh, our community. Uh, and I think you've done such a good job. No one has asked us any questions or sent us any comments. Uh, so that, that lets me know that you were extremely thorough. Um, but I said, uh, we put the text message out there, your website. We know that you are also on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter too, right? That's right. You can find us, Black Voters MTR, and it's on all platforms, Twitter, IG, um, Facebook, Black Voters MTR. You can search Black Voters Matter. Um, you can connect with me on Twitter directly. That's Cliff underscore notes. That's Cliff underscore notes. Um, you can connect with me directly and uh, follow us, you know, follow follow our pages, check out our videos, check out our Kalamazoo video. I, our Kalamazoo video from that stop that we did in Kalamazoo is one of our most popular and most powerful um, videos. That was such a powerful stop that you you help organize and, and or, organize on some short notice, too. And so, um, you know how we do it. I'm ready for it. <laughs> I know it. I know it. I know it. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I appreciate you taking some time to come talk to us. I know it won't be the last time. Uh, we will be representing tomorrow Black Voters Matter. Matter of fact, um, our official T-shirt is the Black Voters Matter T-shirt. On the back, like you said, it says it's about us. And so we will be branding. We will be inspiring. But most importantly, we will do a thorough 
voter registration drive, assist everybody in making sure that they're registered to vote, verifying if they are already registered to vote and making sure that they um, complete their application for their absentee ballot and return it so that they can uh, be ready to get their, their ballot in just a few weeks. So again, thank you. Much love from the Midwest, particularly from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and we'll stay on the battlefield with you. All right, Kalamazoo, uh, that's our time. We have uh, been here with Cliff Albright, one of the co-founding members of uh, Black Voters Matter. They're doing work all across the country and even more so here, right here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. They are a partner, a funder, uh, a supporter of the work of Mothers of Hope. You all will be with us uh, tomorrow for the event. The event is the um, is the actual uh, voter registration drive. It's the Black Lives Matter March. Uh, it starts at one. So we will gather at noon tomorrow uh, at Western Michigan University, right in the center, right in the heart of Western Michigan University, right by the flagpoles. There'll be some live music, some entertainment, some spoken word, uh, just a couple of speakers. You will be able to meet Team Litty, uh, Carlos Nelson, and a group of young individual students who are activists who have been organizing a peaceful protest for the last two weeks right up on uh, West Main and Drake Road. They're going to lead us in this march from the campus of Western Michigan University downtown to Bronson Park. When we get there, there will be even more voter registration. You can do your census. There'll be even more live music. Uh, we will have on the uh, Wheels of Steel, the most incredible DJ Chuck. Coming live and singing is the soulful sound of Denise Wilhite. You all know Denise, she's the lead singer for the Skeletons. We will have some, uh, some additional speakers. We have some young folks, Kimara Lewis uh, from Kamazoo Central High School. Uh, and then we'll have some ability to interact with some folks uh, there. And then immediately after the march, from 4 to 6 p.m., we will be in various sites in the neighborhood, north side, east side, south side. On the east side, we will be having a voter registration block party with Trenches Community Church with Pastor James Harris and the Trenches Community Church family from 4 to 6 p.m. We will also have a, uh, a block party on the north side, uh, and we will also have a block party on the south side at Vine Neighborhood Association. Again, in all three sites, you can register to vote. We will help you complete your census. We will have beverages, snacks, music. We have DJs in all three locations. All we will have is vibes, where Cliff talked about the peace, black love, culture, community, uh, and some very, very good energy. So I hope that you all join us tomorrow starting at noon at um, Western Michigan University. We will kick off the march at one o'clock walking downtown. We'll do some celebration and some partying and some vibing at Bronson Park. And then we're going to dispatch to the three different neighborhoods for another voter registration drive in the evening. So join us, support us, be with us. I love you, Kalamazoo. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in. Be blessed.